Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. There are numerous pathways to a great career. Many people choose the college or university route, but multiple high paying jobs require no college education at all. What are these careers and how can Alaskans train to get them? We'll learn more tonight on Alaska Insight. The future of education in many fields will require coursework for internet-related skills such as website design, program development, and building custom business systems. But there will also continue to be demand for truck drivers to deliver those computer parts and heavy equipment operators to build and maintain the roads for that delivery. Alaska Public Media photographers visited local training and apprenticeship programs for a look into getting a good paying job outside of the traditional college classroom. Adam Ferguson works for Alaska Operating Engineers. How deep? The organization trains Alaskans for careers in heavy equipment operation, hydraulic systems management, heavy duty mechanics, and other construction related fields. Ferguson says a generation of people went to four and five year college programs as he did. But he says he left school with a degree and wondered, where's the job? So I literally went back to working on the same rock crusher that I was working on to get through school um, and applied for this apprenticeship program and went through a whole apprenticeship program after I'd already uh, you know, gotten a college degree and did far better money and benefit wise and supporting a young family than I ever could have with my college degree. So that was a real reality check for me. Ferguson says after more than 16 years working with Alaska operating engineers, he sees the same demand for trade and skilled workers. He says the big change has been in the attitude of educators. My phone blows up with middle schools and high schools asking me to come speak to the kids, which is really exciting because it makes me believe that you know, the, the stigma maybe that was historically associated with being a construction worker uh, is, is going away. Joey Crum, the president and CEO of Northern Industrial Training, says his company offers coursework for welding, mechanics, commercial driving, project management, and other trade training. He says by 2025, 65 percent of Alaskans will need post-secondary training for successful careers. And that can be defined as a third-party high-value certificate, so a CDL, a AWS, American Welding Society certified welder, by 2025. We live in a state where people don't necessarily need college educations in order to have very prosperous careers. Crum says there is a huge need for qualified workers in resource extraction in Prudhoe Bay, especially as older Alaskans approach the end of their careers. Every year we're seeing um, Alaska a grain of the workforce, and so that we have thousands of opportunities across the state in vocational trades, and it's only going to increase regardless of projects, just with natural attrition of people retiring. Adam Ferguson with Alaska Operating Engineers echoes that sentiment, saying it's important for apprentices and trainees to understand the great pay and benefits a career in construction or other trades will provide also requires commitment to pass a drug test, show up early, work hard, and have a great attitude. Most of them start out at around $24 an hour straight time in addition to a $20 an hour fringe package. I can't look a contractor in the eye and sell him an apprentice um, that's earning north of a $45 an hour package with 10 weeks of experience and have anything less than somebody who's willing to show up, work their hearts out, and, and be early. And, and those people seem tough to come by these days, if you will. Uh, that, that's one of our challenges. My guests this evening know of that challenge. Suzanne McCarthy is the director of Alaska Labor's Training School. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. I'm so happy you are. And Scott Eicholt is the business manager for Local 942. Thanks for being here, Scott. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having us. So, Scott, tell us a little about your union membership. Uh, what area does 942 encompass and what professions? Uh, yeah, so uh, we're basically what they commonly refer to as north of the 63rd. 
uh, parallel and uh, everything from Haines down to Ketchikan in the southeast. Uh, our membership is very diverse. We cover a lot of different industries. It includes the oil and gas industry, um, your typical construction, what we call vertical and horizontal, so your roads and highways and buildings. Um, we also uh, represent the transit workers for the Fair Fairbanks North Star Borough. Um, the Westmark Hotel uh, is our members, their laborers. Uh, we have several service uh, contracts on the federal installations, uh, a little bit of manufacturing, so we're just kind of all over the place. Yeah, it sounds that way. Suzanne, what other union organizations does Alaska Laborers Training School provide services for, and where? Okay, uh, we, we are the training arm of the workforce that Scott is talking about at Local 942, and we also serve Local 341, which is based out of Anchorage and covers the southern half of the state. So the training program is a statewide program. We have two training schools, uh, one located in Chugiak, just north of Eagle River, and the other is in Fairbanks, um, off Davis Road on Kiana Street and they're both new facilities that were completed in 2015. So um, we feel really fortunate to have state-of-the-art facilities to train in. Mm -hmm. Scott, how does recruitment work? Do you steer prospects to Suzanne's programs or are you doing the outreach, Suzanne? How, does, how do people come to you? It's, it's kind of a collaboration of both. Um, we'll have folks come in our front door at the Union Hall and inquire on how they can become a member and we'll look at their background and if they have extensive construction background then maybe we'll just take them in on our uh, seed list. Um, generally though we'll steer them to the apprenticeship program and that's uh, part of what Suzanne's uh, crew runs and, and the training center next door there. So beyond the, the apprenticeship programs what else are the pathways that people can come through and, and get trained up for jobs? Well, there's two main types of trainings that we provide the workforce. So if people are experienced construction workers and, and they already have skills, they come in and they can get industry required certifications. Um, things that are either state or federally required um, to do the work. Examples would be hazardous waste hazardous paint handling, asbestos abatement, OSHA 10, all of these industry certifications that have to be renewed regularly. So we provide that to the workforce. The other type of training we do is skills development. So people may come in and they may have worked with scaffolding, but they've never done concrete or they've never done pipe insulation. So we can teach them these skills and develop their skills so that they have a, a wider variety of skills and have more opportunity to go to work, which also helps the hiring halls by having the workforce that can do a variety of things. And what are you seeing for demand right now? What jobs are really uh, the ones that you're most needing to fill? So right now it's more in the uh uh, the vertical construction, our military installations are going through quite an upbuild in the interior. Um, we expect next winter to be pretty busy with oil and gas. So we're going to be transitioning from more of a building and trades type training into the oil and gas sector to prepare for the upcoming season. Uh, so we're hoping for the next five or six years of busy, uh, busy work up there and, and excited for that. What, what jobs are constant and are always needing to be filled? Um, you talked a little about what you're looking toward in the spring, but there must be some professions that are always just a steady demand for new people to come in. Yeah, there's definitely some niche um, skills that uh, take a lot of experience. I mean, just some of that stuff, you just can't put it in a textbook like uh, grade checking or uh, asphalt raking, for example, is a really, you, you have to have an eye for it mm. and a touch for it and know what's going on with the product too. So um, that's a couple of examples. Um, 
stringing pipe in Prudhoe Bay is a very meticulous process and it's high speed. So, um, so you're trying to lay out the pipe for the welders and, and it's got to be precise. So uh, that's just a few examples, I would say. Asphalt raking? Yeah. What, tell, tell us a little about that. So uh, when we're putting our highways and parking lots together, uh, we're laying asphalt and um, when the machine's uh, laying multiple passes, they've got to blend that joint together. Mm. And there's a trick to that. Or uh, putting driveway approaches in, um, you know, coming Connecting up to a it curb. To the roadway. Yeah, so it's, you know, you don't want the material to uh, get separated too much. Um, so there's, there's a lot of tricks to that. Hmm. And, and it's just experience over time, you know. So um, there's only a few crews out there, uh, but there's a high demand for, for new people coming in because, you know, we're getting an aging workforce, so. That, it's so interesting because, you know, when you say asphalt raking, it, it doesn't sound like something that would be very complex or tricky. But as you've described it, I can see why it would need a certain level of skill and expertise, and that would take time to develop. Yeah. Do you see new areas of growth uh, in certain sectors of the Alaska business landscape? Are there new things that you haven't, that haven't been on the horizon before that maybe are? Um, for the interior, we're having, we're going through some growth with the, um, the LNG project. Uh, so right now they're building a five and a quarter million gallon tank uh, for, for natural gas. And that's going to supply the community um, that hasn't had gas before. Uh, so they've been putting a lot of pipe in the ground. Um, we're hoping to start seeing the residents connect to that system as soon as we get the new supply figured out. So I would say that's kind of a new area for us. And what kind of jobs are in demand for that work? Um, pipe layers, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, skilled pipe layers, this is an HDPE product. Uh, so there's a specialized welding process that uh, connects the pipe. Um, you want folks who knows uh, how it goes together, uh, how to do the joints and connections. Um, you know, backfilling the, the uh, pipe is, is uh, there's a process to that. You don't want the material to settle after you've left. Um, so, uh, so there's, you know, there's definitely parts of that process that require some extra attention. Suzanne, tell us how you go about designing programs and who takes the lead. Is it the unions that come to you and say, hey, we need this, can you put something together? How does that process work? The process is actually a partnership process and it's a combination of the hiring halls that Scott's leading and the contractors and the two get together and identify what the industry needs are. And then it's brought to the training school and that's what we incorporate. So we are able to respond pretty quickly to industry needs based on the workforce needs identified at the hiring hall and the contractors who are identifying the skills that they need the hall to pro provide for them. Mm -hmm. So we can respond really quickly. The other kind of big part of what we do at the training school is run the registered apprenticeship program, which is bringing new people with that don't have construction experience into the construction field. And that's, uh, that's a big part of what we're doing now to replenish the aging workforce, as Scott was talking about, and the big projects that are on the horizon, making sure that we have enough people to fill those jobs. Mm -hmm. When you say you can respond quickly, how long does it take to design the, you know, both the curriculum that you have to have and the actual field work program to st stand up a, a new area of training? That's a great question. We um, actually have um, a very rich resource from what we call our internationals. So pe laborers do work all across the United States and throughout Canada. So we have this, uh, this pool of experts that we can pull from. So if there's something new we haven't done in Alaska, we have LIUNA, which is the Labor's International of North America, to pull that already have developed curriculum, um, the instructors and the staff that work in Alaska have a variety of skills. 
So hopefully we have the skills in-house. If not, we reach out to others who have these and we'll bring them in to, to teach. So do you bring trainers in from outside that maybe come just for short periods of time or, or are they moving here to work in your facility? No, it's usually for short periods of time. So if we, if we have a need in Alaska, we might bring an expert from somewhere else to come and teach our instructors. Okay. How to use that curriculum. So it's uh, we we're self sufficient in Alaska, but we can tap into this big national international resource. When you're uh, working with apprentices, are you matching them up? You mentioned the graying of the workforce and people are aging out of their careers. So are these apprentices matched up with kind of a elder mentor that helps them? Um, learn the work in sort of in real a real setting yes it is a combination of training that we do at the training school kind of the classroom but it's hands-on shop work outdoor work and that's matched up with field experience so there it's on the job learning so they get paid to go on the job they get a lesser scale because they're learning and they're matched up with journey workers who are the masters of that. And they don't stay at one place. It's a 5,100 hour program. It takes about three and a half years, almost four years, depending on the amount of work. Um, so they get to experience sometimes four different jobs, five different jobs, different types of work so that they understand the whole variety of work type that laborers do and then they can kind of choose their specialty I'm really good at this and not so good at that and they can get m more qualified in in the track that they're going toward so that is a proven way to develop the workforce in the fastest manner it's a mentorship and and that's what really the apprenticeship is all about it it, it works how have both of you seen the uh, the need change as you've been doing this work and and how challenging is it to meet that need for students? Do you, do you have a, a typical student or who's coming into the programs today as opposed to maybe years ago? Yeah, I mean that's that's another good question. Um, through the years um, you'll see the the demand rise and fall with the industry. Um, the interior has experienced a pretty slow point for the last couple of years for, uh, let's say, for uh, vertical construction, putting buildings up. Um, but the highway work didn't really slow down. Um, we've seen a slowdown in Prudhoe Bay. So uh, as these industries start to pick back up, then we kind of shift focus to those particular industries. As far as recruitment, um, and I'll let Suzanne speak to this in a second here, um, we're always looking for new pools uh, to pull from. Uh, we've got great relationships with the different native communities uh, and that's a, that's a constant thing of development for us. Um, we just want to keep expanding that. We understand that there's high unemployment rates in the villages. Um, there's great talent out there that's an untapped resource. Uh, so we're always looking for ways to encourage those young folks to come in and apply. Uh, the military community, um, what better place to find somebody who knows how to get up in the morning, is disciplined, can take orders, and is hard workers. Um, the military community definitely brings that uh, to the table. So we're constantly looking at new ways of encouraging those folks to come apply to our program. And Suzanne, from your perspective, have, have you seen the demographics change through the years? It is. A, it is a challenge. The bar to get into the apprenticeship programs has really increased over the last several years. Um, the biggest one is everybody has to be drug free mm -hmm. and this is the way the, the world is in Alaska. Um, it's also been a challenge because our young people in high school aren't really told about the construction pathway to a career. Um, a lot of people are told you have to go to college and and it, it's great. Everybody needs to continue. Everybody needs a post-secondary education. You, you have to develop that. But the pathway through construction apprenticeship is they get paid 
while they're learning so they can sustain themselves and they don't finish with educational debt. When apprentices come in for the laborers, they come in at over $18 an hour. They get a 10% wage increase every thousand hours they work. And when they finish the program, they're making at least $30.33 an hour. Now, if they have a specialty, they can make 37 or, or more. They're working a lot of overtime. So during their apprenticeship, they're making between 45 and 60,000, depending on how much they're working. And after they journey out, they can make 100,000 plus, just depending on how much they work. So it's a, it's a program that I think that a lot of our, our folks who are advising young people on career tracks need to help educate our young people that this is a really viable option. There's a pathways to leadership, there's pathways to being a superintendent or construction owner, a company owner. Um, there's, it's really a, a springboard for a, a high demand, high paying career track in Alaska. And, and that's what we're trying to do is get the word out there so all of our young people can take these and fill these high wage jobs and we don't have to depend on people outside of Alaska to come in because we don't have the skilled workforce. Like Scott said, you can't give them these skills in one year. And when these jobs start, they need a skilled workforce, so they have to have the experience already. And are you saying that when they get done with their apprenticeship program, they have been paying as they go so that they don't they have no debt or they do they have zero some debt. No debt. No debt. So no educational debt. So so who pays for the program? Again, that's this partnership between the hiring halls who are putting the workforce together and the construction management companies, they understand that training is a key to getting a stable, highly skilled functioning workforce. So it is in their best interest to support these programs. So we vet people pretty, pretty highly. So if they're, they come with the commitment to finishing this program, learning all they can, working as hard as they can, getting paid as much as they can, and it's really a win-win for everybody. It's a win for the individual, it's a win for the companies, and it's a win for the hiring hall, having this highly trained, skilled workforce to pull from. How about women? How many women come into the programs and, and what's their level of success? Um, for the laborers, we are probably the, the most physically demanding of the construction craft. So um, it's a challenge to recruit women, but we do have between 10 and 12% women in our apprenticeship program. It does take a special type of woman to want to be a laborer and to do the hard work. Alaska is full of those women, but <laughs> how do we get them to know this pathway? They have been very successful. Um, they come with a different skill set. Contractors know you're not going to take, you know, a 120 pound woman and give her a job that's really for a 220 pound man. You find where they work, and uh, we we have women that are just. Uh, huge success and and are doing doing great and journey out and and work for contractors um, and are the go-to person on their crews so it's exciting to get people to turn on to these career paths that they don't know that are possible absolutely is the placement rate 100 percent or do Talk a little bit about that and, and the success maybe within that first six months or so. Uh, what do you see, Scott, in that regard? Do some people start off and then they kind of wash out or what's the, what's the success do. rate? Yeah, some do. Um, we, you know, success rate is something that we're constantly working on. And uh, Suzanne, correct me, but I think we're in the, uh, the ballpark of 50 to 60 percent success rate of people actually finishing the program and staying in, in the laborers. Um, for various reasons, we'll have people that wash out. Um, some of them decide they just don't want to be a laborer. It's too tough. Um, some of them have other issues. You know, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't think it's fair to really go into some detail. But no, that's fine. Um, but for various reasons, mm -hmm. you know, they may wash out of the program. We're always looking at ways we can improve that uh, through our vetting system or 
uh, through accommodations or whatever it takes, you know, because we On want the these front folks. end. Yeah, we want them. It's a huge investment for mm -hmm. uh, for our members. It's it's not the union's money. It's the members' money that we're we're uh, spending here, and we want to make sure that we do that as responsibly as we can. And the most responsible way is to make sure that our folks are successful. That they're ready for what's to come and how yeah. rigorous that schedule is going to be. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Ike Holt and Suzanne McCarthy for being my guests this evening. Glad to be here. Thank you. As tonight's guests described, there are a variety of ways Alaskans can access training to learn skills for jobs that are in high demand and pay a good wage. Some students may use their training to get to work faster than taking the traditional university route, but they may also use their trade employment to help them pay for higher education down the road. You can watch past episodes of Alaska Insight online at alaskapublic.org slash alaskainsight or stream them on AK Passport. We return next Friday at 7.30 p.m. right after Washington week. Until then, stay informed and connected by listening to your locally owned and operated public radio station. Thanks for joining Alaska Public Media for this edition of Alaska Insight. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.